April 25 earthquake and the recurring aftershocks, basically unexpected, but triggered a tragedy to thousands of lives all across Nepal. Not only the lives, but the demolition of infrastructures, houses, Cultural heritage is right in front of their eyes has caused a lot of people into unexpected trauma and they are in the, in the state of extreme pain and agony. We have been noticing the status since the massive earthquake that hit Nepal on 25th of April on a bright, very beautiful Saturday morning. And the state of people after the earthquake that has that we have been noticing, we have been witnessing is completely unexpected. We are not being able to come out of that particular trauma that we faced on that very day and the recurring aftershocks. So, referring to what has been happening within the country and the status of mind people have been facing all around the, all around the country, all across the country, today on this edition of the contemporary talks, we are talking about psychosocial counseling and trauma counseling. I'm Sabana Podol, and we have for today with us a very expert, a very renowned expert on this particular issue. We have Professor John Peter Sitch. He is a professor of uh, professor at the Department of Criminology, California State University, Fresno. We'll be talking about the state, we'll be talking about the issue. Psychosocial counseling sounds pretty new at Nepal, but uh, is a very important issue at the current situation. Let me welcome Professor Dasich. Welcome, uh, Professor Dasich. So, um, as I stated, the April 25 earthquake, the uh, almost, uh, almost uh, 7.9 Richter scale earthquake, that was completely unexpected for anyone. Although we knew that we were in a high seismic, uh, seismologically active zone, but that was completely unexpected. And what happened after that, that is completely unexpected. We can hear people are still in agony. So when we start this interview, let us talk actually what is psychosocial counseling? What is actually it about? What is the applicability of psychosocial counseling? First, thank you for inviting me to come here and speak. Um, I would like to say that the concept of psychosocial coping is a, a relatively new concept. Right. It takes into account what happens to victims psychologically and socially, because both are very important dimensions of the experience of being a victim, especially in the aftershock. So within the umbrella of psychosocial concepts, we bring this together and we use both of those disciplines to help the victims suffer less and uh, recover quicker. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the present status of Nepal. What is the applicability? Where is psychosocial counsel counseling actually needed in this state? I think it's important that people understand after the search and rescue, which is usually over in a few weeks, Right. Uh, most of the people who came here to do that have left. Uh, now, now what comes to the surface is the awareness and the, the sensations of remembering those that they lost, remembering the property that they lost. So loss itself is a very important emotion that they have to cope with. Right. And they need help in that process, especially the loss associated with human beings. Correct. So now we begin to talk about grief, which is a very strong emotion. Um, and then the third most important emotion is fear, a continuing fear. Uh, we had three earthquakes in the last two weeks, right. uh, about four, four point zero to four point five, I think, and those are major triggers. They re they remind people immediately of the terrible two earthquakes that hit, and they don't know if it's going to be worse or less, and so you have this panic response. Correct. And so there needs to be someone to explain people what's going on, to explain the reality that usually in big earthquakes there are aftershocks and they diminish in size and diminish in, in uh, occasion. So, so it's a, a critical uh, part of the response is explaining the truth, explaining the reality. We sometimes call that psychological first aid. So it's some of the things you can do early and you can do it for everyone because everyone has been experiencing these, these shocks. Um, 
the people that should go to visit the victims now are those who can talk to large numbers of people, school children, uh, auditoriums, television is a wonderful medium to do this, and explain to people that some of the easy things that they can do include simply talking about it right. and not being silent, even Correct. though it's very natural to want to be silent uh, because you think, I'm the only one that's feeling this strange. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people feel so strange, they may say to themselves or to a counselor, I feel like I'm going crazy. But the truth is, they're not going crazy. They're not reacting crazy. It's the situation that's crazy. <laughs> the situation that's abnormal, not there. Their reactions are normal, and they need to understand that, really. Um, and talking about it helps to reduce the stress. Um, also, recognizing that the sooner they can back to get back to normal life situations mm -hmm. with children, it's a good idea to get them back into school, even if they're reluctant, right. even if uh, they want to stay home because... Uh, one of the normal reactions of children is that they kind of revert back to an earlier kind of mindset. And uh, they want to stay close to their parents, they cling more, they become more dependent. So gently nudging them towards school and, right. and uh, getting them back into a, a routine of normalcy is very helpful. <laughs> Professor Desich, uh, if you would uh, let me intervene you, uh, you have been involved in uh, the psychosocial counseling since very long. You're an expert in this. Uh, according to, from your experience, from what you've experienced all around the world, uh, how long does it take normally to come out of the trauma or uh, to recover that particular trauma in, a, no, uh, like in an average? There is a danger in my response here. And the danger is that I'm generalizing what will happen to all the people, right. and that's impossible. Correct. Each person is an individual. Um, some people have good coping skills before the earthquake, and they can cope very well. Uh, and they may get over the stress, the initial stress re reactions, uh, maybe within weeks. Mm -hmm. About 50% of them will not get over it in, in weeks. It'll take longer, maybe months. And a very small percentage, maybe 10%, will need significant counseling, psychosocial mm -hmm. counseling uh, at the upper levels, professional levels, where psychologists and psychiatrists can deal with uh, what we call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Especially if they had uh, emotional problems before the earthquake. Mm -hmm. So this would make their normal coping skills more problematic. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Professor Dasit, you've been in Nepal since past two weeks. Yes. So, uh, how have you seen? It has already been more than a month uh, we faced uh, the unexpected and devastating earthquake. How have you seen? How's the scene? You've visited a lot of uh, places as well, yes. even outside Kathmandu, as you said, uh, rural areas as well, some remote areas. How do you see it? How's the scene over there? Um, first, I'm familiar with the scene. There is a certain aura, a certain atmosphere of, uh, of stress. You see it in people's faces mm -hmm. and you see it in many other disasters in the world. Same expression of loss, confusion, depression, grief, fear. Uh, and these are all normal reactions, mm -hmm. again, to an abnormal situation. Um, I see a lot of people doing wonderful things. I see people uh, doing heroic things, mm -hmm. dedicating their lives, not going to work but helping other people uh, because they realize that they need something, they need a companion, they need a person to talk to. Um, unfortunately, I also see the lack of trained responders. Right. Um, Correct. That's really unfortunate. Uh, yes. And it need not be that way. I think Nepal should address that as one of its top priorities. Mm -hmm because this is not the last earthquake that Nepal will have, or any other disaster for that matter. There are right. coming the monsoon season, we, we have all the people living in tents, poorly constructed, not designed for monsoons. Right. Some of them right in the path of, of rivers that will raise. Uh, I think um, I see a lot of people who are still desperate, 
a lot of people who are uh, trying to figure out what happened and trying to make sense of it uh, have not had the opportunity to meet uh, psychosocial counselors. Yes. Uh, beg pardon? Right. Yeah. yeah and correct. I think, uh, I think it's uh, wonderful that one of the resources is very abundant, and that's food. Mm -hmm. Usually in a disaster, uh, food is hard to get. Correct. But as I go around and talk to people, they're well fed, there's plenty of food on the streets, there's lots of food in the gardens that are growing, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's one important resource. There's also abundance of water, maybe an overabundance of water <laughs> in the next few weeks. Uh, <laughs> so what is really needed are what we call interventions. Interventions means something that you do to stop the spreading or the growing of trauma. You don't want this, this sense of fear to continue to grow because mm -hmm. then it becomes worse. Okay, uh, Professor Dasich, uh, let me intervene you right here. A uh, few minutes before we started this interview, one of my friends, uh, before I was like actually getting ready for the interview, one of my friends, what she said was like, even if somebody shouts, she feels like earthquake, that there's another earthquake. Yes. Is it some kind of state that uh, where one should realize that one needs psychosocial counseling? It's one of the things. We call these triggers. Right. Um, normal triggers are dates. Mm -hmm. In the few classes that I've been holding recently, we talked about this. Right. And the most popular mentioned trigger as a date is the word, the number 25 or the number 12, mm -hmm. right? as you can explain what that is. Yes. Uh, even the word earthquake or right. the word disaster Correct. immediately gives you a flashback. Mm -hmm. So there are many, many different triggers. Those will slowly go away. They become uh, less important as people realize uh, that there is not an earthquake coming just because they're thinking about the number 25. Mm -hmm. uh, also the time, the time of day. When Maybe the even the day as well. That's right. Saturday, Tuesday. Exactly right. Now you got it. Right. The triggers are very real and they have greater power to disturb people earlier. Mm -hmm. And so now we are in, in the second month, the third month. Yes. But um, it is part of understanding these victims, that these triggers, again, are normal reactions, mm -hmm. not abnormal reactions. Right but their strength will go, go away eventually. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that might stay is the loss of sleep. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people feel more vulnerable at night in the darkness. Uh, also, some people having eating disturbances. They don't feel as hungry as they did before because their stomach mm -hmm. is tense, right. which means that there's a lot of anxiety still to be dealt with. Among the school children that I did an intervention with, uh, was this idea of, of fear and anxiety. And uh, ironically, one of the last aftershocks mm -hmm. was in the middle of my intervention. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly we had to exit the school. Uh, and then after we came back 20 minutes later, we talked about what the feelings were. It was, it was really uh, something because we, we could each see, all these children could see, everyone's mm -hmm. eyes were wide and they were breathing faster. So I, I pointed these things out. I said, these are normal reactions to the abnormal aftershock. Mm -hmm. And they, they seem to be, even though they were just children, they seem to understand uh, how that could affect what was going on. And so I, one of the exercises that I did is give them the opportunity to talk to each other right. about what happened and their feelings about it. Usually people don't express feelings right Correct. away. They, they can describe the earthquake. So we talked about different visual stimuli of the earthquake. Well, what is the visual stimuli? Well, it moves. Mm -hmm. Things move that don't normally move. Yes. What kind of sounds are unique? Correct. The rumble, the explosion, the, the vibration. Um, are there any smells with earthquakes? Well, not usually. Mm -hmm. But um, if something is broken, if the sewage is broken, there may be a unique smell. Correct. Um, and then there's the feeling yes. of the earthquake, the, the actual movement, the vibration. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, but you can feel it. So a lot of times people have a trigger of a feeling. Maybe a truck goes by 
and it shakes the ground and they think, mm -hmm. oh, it's an earthquake, but it's not. So eventually people will understand that those things are normal, they're not earthquakes, mm -hmm. but it's going to take a few months. Mm -hmm. This was uh, not really, actually, uh, the previous uh, major disaster that we faced, it was somewhere around, uh, let's say, 20 years back, and that was not that much, uh, the, not in very high intensity. The one that we remember is uh, that of, uh, let's say, around uh, 70, 80 years back. And uh, to see it today, to witness it today, it's uh, much more unexpected in one hand, and the other one is like, it's difficult to cope with what the things are going on. Yes. So uh, another thing that I wanted to ask you is like, you've been here since uh, a long time, let's say two weeks, and you've seen the actual picture within valley and even uh, outside the valley as well, in very remote, remote areas as well. You have been with children, probably with women, elderly people, and mm -hmm. uh, the other vulnerable group of society as yes. well. So uh, if we talk about the role or intervention that state or let's say uh, as media, even what we did, how, how do you say it? How do you see it? Uh, how do you explain the role of media or state? Uh, was it satisfactory or was it good in intervening or uh, to help the people come out of uh, what they mm. were feeling of the pain or agony? I'm glad you asked that question. The first group of people that I spoke to were journalists. Mm -hmm. And that was the subject of my, my chat, uh, the role of the media. Right. And the media has a, an extremely important role uh, because they have usually accurate information and that's what people need. I would say that probably the single most important thing that people need in this situation is information. Mm -hmm. Accurate information, regular information, reg information about everything from the, the magnitude of the earthquake to where they hit, where it hit most, uh, uh, where, the, where the effect was of greatest impact. Uh, also important for the media is to provide information that they don't have, like where to get services. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the kinds of services that are available and how to access those services. So access to information uh, is difficult, especially in the rural areas where they may not have television or internet or, mm -hmm. or uh, those are things that uh, are in great need because they usually do have television and you can speak to them in their own language um, and it's very comforting to know the facts and to trust. I think one of the, one of the problems that sometimes arises in many countries where there are disasters, is a mistrust of the government. Right. And they see, they imagine the worst. They think maybe somebody's trying to control them or something, something is being hidden. And so the media has a wonderful opportunity to allay those fears and to tell them the truth and to build a sense of trust. Um, so that's, I think that's the key role for, for the media, is to provide continuous information, mm -hmm. not just now after the, the, the rescue mission is over, but for the next months as they struggle to recover and, and get back to a sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. And you can also encourage them right. using some of the things that I also used in the uh, schools, is to encourage them to talk to each other and to be non-judgmental mm -hmm. uh, and to be optimistic and to make plans for the future. These are mm -hmm. all important features uh, to reduce stress. Mm -hmm. Professor, you said it uh, in the very first phase of the interview that this is not going to be the last one that Nepal witnessed. So what do you say? How should we be prepared for tomorrow or for the possible uh, disaster on the coming mm. days? I'm glad you asked me that question. That's a very important question. I, I have some opinions about it. I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, I lived in Japan 20 years. I've been through many earthquakes, mm -hmm. and many of them were seven-point earthquakes. And in Japan, rarely are there deaths at the magnitude of this uh, earthquake, or these two earthquakes. And I think the difference is that most buildings in Japan, not all, not yet, but most buildings in Japan have earthquake standards. They were not allowed to build those buildings unless they built them with earthquake standards. And that one thing alone, I think Nepal can do. Mm -hmm. I think they should immediately make a commitment that all building permits should have earthquake standards or they will not be approved. But then they should go the next step. They should, I think, inspect carefully all other buildings and those that are 
not according to earthquake standards should be made to earthquake standards or completely brought down and built back up. Mm -hmm. By doing that, you can save an enormous number of lives. I think the last figure I saw was something like 8,500 people were killed. Majority of those people were, were killed inside their own homes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Homes made with mud bricks. Those are not earthquake standards. And so in a way, there is a responsibility of the government to not allow those kind of constructions to go up. Even though they're cheaper, they're the most lethal kinds of buildings. I've created a, what I call a plan mm -hmm. for Nepal, a five-point plan, if I may share that with you. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the first things is that I would recommend the establishment of a special position directly under the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. and I would call it the Victim Ombudsman for Victims. Right. Uh, and this would be an office. This, this Ombudsman's office would be something that would be independent from politics, would not be part of any ministry. Mm -hmm. And this person would have oversight to all kinds of victims, not just disaster victims, but crime victims, terrorist victims, human rights victims, uh, human trafficking victims. So there are many different kinds of victims. Right. They all deserve to be treated and to be helped and to recover. Right now, those things are not happening in a uniform way. Um, if I may, I'd like to yeah. refer to my notes. Yes. Uh, the point two is to create a network of victim assistance programs for crime victims. Mm -hmm. That's also missing. Right. Most other countries, uh, under the United Nations Declaration of Basic Principles of Justice for Victims of Crime and Abuse of Power, this is a, an international instrument of standards for mm -hmm. treating crime victims yes. and abuse of power victims. That would justify uh, creating victim assistance programs with trained people, people who are trained with very high standards and maintained. So I think that uh, it is also important under this office of ombudsman mm -hmm. that a, a training academy developed so that once a year for two weeks, all people who want to become employees uh, as victim advocates must go to this school of, of victim assistance training. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I would like to see, although there is victim compensation for some categories of victims, especially women and children, domestic violence victims, all victims should have access to compensation because they mm -hmm. all have similar needs. So I would like to see Nepal move in the direction of creating a national victim compensation program, carefully monitored uh, and properly funded. And the fourth point is to establish a national plan for disaster relief that would be staffed by victim advocates mm -hmm. already trained. Right. And if they're working for crime victims, they would also not only be well trained, but now they've had experiences. They would be working as a profession. As soon as there is a, a disaster, another earthquake or a flood, these people would be the pool of victim advocates already trained that can be used, mm -hmm. which is not happening now. Many of right. the people, I'm even willing to say most of the people that are out working with victims are doing the best they can, but they have not been properly trained. Not only are they, are they being victimized themselves from what they see and what they feel, but they may be making some mistakes and re-victimizing the victims. So. Properly trained people would eliminate those two problems. And finally, my last point, point five, I think it's critical that if you accept this kind of plan or something like it, this is just a draft, is that this needs to be evaluated honestly and scientifically once a year by an outside agent, possibly a consultant, mm -hmm. who has high skills and who can deliver an honest report because that way these recommendations can be improved and, and honest information can be given to the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. I think this would move you in a direction of saving a lot of lives and I think this is what the people really want to know, that there are definite plans made that will be implemented, right. not just words, not just paper, but real implementation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I learned about uh, this uh, theory that uh, you worked out on. It's called John's coping theory. 
Ah. <laughs> you, you, you would like to say anything about this? We are almost well, at the end of uh, our interview. I have a theory, which I call the psychosocial coping theory, mm -hmm. developed about 30 years ago. Right. And it's, it's all about managing resources. Everything we do, even the fact that you're clearing your hair, mm -hmm. that's a coping method. You, something maybe is falling down. And you're, so we do coping all day, every day. So it's more than just a coping theory for disasters. It's a coping theory for life. Mm -hmm. But coping is very critical mm -hmm. when we're in danger, when we're suffering. And it's not the same kind of coping that we do in normal life. Mm -hmm. So we need to teach people how should they cope during a disaster. Right. Some people did the wrong things. Children ran from outside to inside and got killed. Those are not proper coping skills. Children should be taught more accurately, more carefully. Not just children, but elders and, and other people of all ages. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the theory helps you understand these realities. Mm -hmm. uh, and and they, uh, the other thing is that when you try to help someone recover, one of the strongest tools is to give them the resources that they don't have. And one of the things they don't have is an understanding of how to cope. Right. Another thing they frequently don't have is enough close friends around them that can give them feedback and support. Mm -hmm. So the theory is not only for understanding victimization, but also for helping recovery. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dasich. Uh, we had uh, Professor John Dasich, uh, who is uh, a professor from the Department of Criminology at uh, California State University. We talked about psychosocial counseling and trauma counseling. Thank you, so very, uh, thank you very much for being with us. Keep watching Nepal and TV News. Have a good day ahead. Namaste.